Welcome and thank you for joining Delivering Quality, a Holistic Approach presented by Digineer. My name is Jack Thiesing and I will be your moderator today. I would like to introduce today's speaker. Paresh Gajria is a quality assurance consultant at Digineer with 18 years of experience in the testing and quality field. He is also a certified scrum master and agilist. Paresh has direct industry experience in e-commerce, healthcare, manufacturing, and travel. As an adjunct professor, he also trains and teaches quality assurance at the college level. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature of this webinar. Also, Paresh is broadcasting with his webcam. Zoom has options that allow you to change how you see the presenter during the presentation. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Paresh. Paresh, you are on mute. My apologies. Thank you so much, Jack. This is my first time doing this and now we learn. Uh, thank you so much everyone for joining today uh, on our delivery quality, a holistic approach. Um, I was honored to ask to be asked uh, by the Digineer team to present my approach on how we uh, look at quality for delivery, but not only for projects, but for also day-to-day -day, uh, project lifecycle work. So this approach here is something that I've gained experience in from over the years. Uh, my background started as a manual tester uh, back in the day when I first started in the IT field. And lately I've been coaching and helping directors and CIOs at my current uh, client to figure out how we can move quality upstream. Uh, I want to give a shout out to a couple of my coworkers, specifically Heather Schultz, who also has helped shape this conversation uh, from a product owner perspective. So let's just jump into it. Um, we are looking to, let me know when you guys can see the slide here. Uh, what I hope to have you guys learn from this webinar today is to understand the quality as a term and as a concept is a constant practice. We're not talking about testing only, but looking at it from a holistic approach. I'm going to use that word quite a bit. Um, there's no voodoo here. There's no magic science. It truly is just taking a larger spec view of what everyone perceives to be quality work. Um, we're going to talk about how testing is not quality. And then closing the quality perception gap between delivery teams, uh, specifically looking at the leadership view and then the contributor view. And, and as people who work in our fields, we understand that leadership sometimes has a different perspective of what quality work is versus what a contributor might think. And I will talk to you about what I call the culture of quality quotient. It's something that uh, we've come up with here at Digineer um, and something we've been using consistently at a couple of clients to start looking at how we can inculcate and instill a culture of quality enterprise-wide. And then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end of the conversation. So let's talk about this. This is a little bit of a busy slide and I apologize, but I wanted to get content on here as quality is a constant practice. Um, <clears throat> as professionals, when we enter a project or we're in the middle of a project, we keep hearing phrases like, um, let's hope it's a good deliverable. Let's uh, make sure that we hit our target. Let's make sure that we deliver. Um, and I think that the base concept of that is to start asking questions as to what does quality mean to different aspects of the, so uh, of the software development lifecycle and the folks involved in delivering a project. Now, these four boxes you see here are quite possibly the four pillars of what's um, available today to us in a, in a standard delivery model. But there's other things like logistics, operations, customer service, call centers that are involved here. And, and these questions would apply across the way. Um, so let's start at the bottom left with product owners. Um, when I walk into a project and I start looking at you know, deliverables and, and the end goal, I start asking questions like so, is, um, is the design fulfilled? Um, do the requirements that are in my hand and what are available to me and to the team at large align with the vision? Um, I usually call the vision the back of the bar napkin idea 
someone sat at a bar, someone sat, you know, down at, at a lunch hour and said, hey, I had this really cool idea and they sketched it out on the back of a napkin. And did we take that, uh, the soul of the idea and make it into a testable requirement? Was there a good verbal and visual representation of the outcome? And more importantly, did we ask why? Um, I find that when you have those questions asked of a product owner or a, uh, a product leader, uh, you start to have the organic conversation of, well, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. And I don't know if that's a great idea or not, or maybe it is a good idea. And you start looking at things from a, again, a, a universal holistic approach. It's not just about building a widget. It's about understanding why you're building the widget and will the widget improve the overall experience of the product you're looking to deliver. And this holds true from cars and car parts all the way down to software and, and even in-body hardware like pacemakers. You got to ask yourself why you're building it and what you hope to intend to build it for. Um, once you slide to the right a little bit more, you go into development. And these are the contributors who are hands on keyboard uh, who are looking at things and the questions to be asked of them is, is the code well built? And I understand that that statement is very generic. Um, when I say well built, each organization has its own language and has its own um, approach to what well built is. Uh, and so when we walk in as consultants, it is on our shoulders from a engineer perspective to ask uh, our clients, what's your current go to standard of good? And is it well built in those parameters? Um, did the application integration go okay? Uh, when you start putting code in from different folks, uh, is it integrating well? Did you have uh, unit testing done? Did you have things done from a, uh, a requirements breakdown mapping back to the requirements approach? Were you looking at impact downstream? Um, and more importantly, again, this is a very generic question, but a very important question to ask is, did we ask how? Um, I find that when I ask a developer walking into a conversation, like, how'd you build this? And if there's a pause in that response, my question usually is, okay, show me how you built it. And that's important because um, from a digineer perspective and from, from our practices perspective, we have certain tenets of responsibility we walk in with, which is being authentic and being a part of the team. Uh, we look to our teammates to, to be asked the difficult questions early on in the delivery. So we don't have to ask the questions at the end. Um, if there's any questions, please keep asking. You know, I haven't seen anything pop yet, but I, I will take a break here at, at this slide to answer polls and questions coming in. Um, when you move into the test, this is the big deal, right? This is the one that it, it, everybody faces that crunch is what I like to call it. Um, we have a 12 week cycle and we have six days to test. And I feel like that's always setting yourself up for failure. So test is required to ask those questions that the people in these roles uh, I coach and I highly, highly encourage the folks in these roles to ask about uh, what the adequate coverage is. Was that adequate coverage? Um, when the coverage is identified, is the coverage accurate? Um, do we uh, admittedly understand the difference between verification and validation? Um, those are two different practices. Those are two different approaches. Um, and then did we ask what we built? Uh, and again, again, these are these are the things I ask my students when they're going through their projects is, do we ask why, do we ask how, do we ask what? Um, and then were the requirements testable? And more often than not, when we start asking that last question, were the requirements testable? We see our projects falter. Um, in our projects falter because a requirement is written in a silo where a product owner who may or may not be communicating well with their development and test leads writes a, a requirement that functions in a certain way, but when you try, uh, start to try and test it, the requirement falls apart. And so those are constant questions that I've been coaching. Even today, this morning, I had a conversation with the test team around an escalation and an incident um, about the fact that was the requirement testable and there was no clean answer. And therein lies what we need to talk about as a constant practice. Uh, and before I wrap up on the slide, the last part is business. And business is a very generic term. I know that from an IT perspective, we use business sometimes as a catch-all 
Um, I define business for my own uh, for my own sanity and for my own approach to this practice. I define business as anybody who is not under an IT organization. This could include a support team as customer service. This could include a bridge team as customer advocates. These are the folks that uh, go between our uh, sales folks and our advocates and come back to us as tech translators, if I was to use the word. Um, I also use them as business side uh, product owners, not IT product owners. So not people on the product, but people on the project. Um, so as a catch-all term, um, I ask these folks and they ask of me back is, does it do what I ask? It being the deliverable in hand. Uh, are my customers happy? Uh, customers could be internal. A customer could be external. Um, are the customers happy? Is the company making revenue? Uh, we don't do this work for free. So any product we do push out, is it going to make us money? Is it going to make the company money? And, and quality is defined in a certain way for me. I, def I define quality in a different way for that um, in the sense that a lot of people look at quality assurance and quality control. The practice of quality assurance and the act of testing as a cost center. Uh, it's going to cost me this much money to test. It's going to cost us this much time to test. Whereas I am of the other opinion where is, is if you ask these questions and if you force the authentic, transparent conversation around these difficult problems, you are saving money because you're not bringing 50 people to an escalation. You're not bringing in you know, a, a fire drill at any point in time. If you continually ask and constantly approach your projects from is this good enough and what is good and can I get there and close that gap? You are now starting to build revenue because money saved, money earned. Um, so I look at quality as a revenue center. I don't look at it as a cost center. Um, I look at this from a constant, uh, a constant practice in the fact that we often get drowned in our daily tasks. I got to do this. I have to do a status. I have to do a, a spreadsheet. I got to get a status out for testing and I have a thousand test cases to do so. What am I going to do for those? Um, and we don't take a step back and go, why? Why am I doing this? Why am I not asking the question of what is the goal here? How am I getting there? Uh, why am I doing this? Um, and so I'll pause there. Uh, Jack, I don't know if we have a poll coming in or if you have questions that need to be answered here. We do. We have a poll about roadblocks that I've launched and we'll give people a few seconds here to answer. <clears throat> Looks like some answers are coming in. I'm going to leave the poll open for another 10 seconds or so. <clears throat> I also want to point out that this uh, poll didn't have the dreaded last option, all of the above, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people on this poll are going to be like, oh my God, it's all of the above. All right. Thank you for those that answered. I'm going to share the results. Timelines and constraints. I think that's fair. Um, so with timelines and constraints, before we move to the next slide here really quick, um, I, we will talk about resource constraints and timelines here in the next couple of slides. But I think the one thing that we've seen in the last two, maybe three years, I've seen rather, I wouldn't say we, but I've seen, uh, is that as companies are moving from waterfall monolithic applications to uh, agile cloud-based applications, the human capital, the people behind the keyboards are struggling with agility as a concept, are struggling with timelines as a concept, which in turn leads to not managing the time, which in turn leads to turnover in resources. And also the, the change of the fact that for the longest time uh, in the late 2000s, mid 2010s, uh, we used throw the bodies at a problem as a solution. So we'll open up to q and I would like to have that conversation uh, in a second here. Let me move to the next slide really quick. Hopefully it moves down, there you go. All right. So. Uh, regarding timelines and constraints, let's dispel the myth. Uh, resource constraints usually come along the, the times when we need testers. Um, I've heard this for every project. If I had a dollar, I would have 
quite a few dollars. Um, the, the idea that you can just throw testers at a problem. So we need to dispel the myth that you can test quality into a product. Um, I will give you a, a, a recent example. I know Heather's on the webinar with us today. She's one of our, 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 our consultants at uh, Digineer at our current client. Heather and I had this conversation three and a half, four weeks ago for a product launch that she was going through. Uh, and I got brought in to help take another view. Um, the uh, project in question required us to migrate approximately two to 3,000 call center agents from a legacy system to a new system. Um, on the day of the launch, we started getting a lot of issues, uh, and I'm trying to be careful about how I, I, I explain these. These are issues around uh, provisioning, logins, ability to do their work, the, uh, the advocates for them on the call center to actually do their work. And as we ran into these issues, there was a fork in the road where it was either to pull all the code back or to throw 80 people at it, working nights and weekends to solve all the issues coming up. And at the end of that effort, we still got feedback from the business going, not good enough, because we missed a lot of issues that were prepping up and popping up from what I felt like in hindsight would have been questions that should have been asked way in advance. Um, are you trained? Do you have the playbook you need? And these are quality questions. These are not questions around task. You're asking a question of your business partners. You're asking a question of your implementation team to say, hey, we built the code. We think the code is at, at this point up to spec and up to snuff. It's not tested enough, right? And we need to ha start having a conversation about the timelines. So turning the timelines to your favor. This is highly important. As someone who started in my career with a full head of hair. And as you can see, I don't have any more. Um, timelines is what killed my hairline. Um, the ability and the inability of a conversation for turning timelines is huge. You have to be in a position to always, whether it makes people upset or not, look at the product in question. Look at the delivery in question. We all come at our jobs from a, am I doing my job well enough kind of perspective? And that's okay. I think I would encourage you when leaving this webinar to ask the question of, is what I'm delivering up to snuff? And I don't, for me personally, I, also, I have this pep talk that I give myself going that while I do care about a person's ability to contribute to the project, I have to separate their feelings on when I ask this question next, which is, did you do a good enough job? Did we do a good enough job? Did we deliver this the right way? And people take that personally because they feel like you're questioning their motives and you're questioning their skills. And that is not the question here. The question is based on the parameters provided, based on the requirements provided, did we do X, Y, and Z to achieve a quality product? When it comes to the timelines, you also then have to understand the difference between urgency and importance. And I'm gonna ask this question. I'm hoping I see vigorous nodding well, I, I, I can't see it, but I'm hoping you guys are vigorously nodding, is you'll get someone in your chain of command coming to you and going, hey, this just came up. I need you to test this or I need you to validate this. I need you to do X by noon. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had the difficult conversation to turn around and go, okay, about how important is it? And that either leads to a do as I tell you conversation or, oh crap, you're right, it's not that important. It just came flying down the pike. And too often we are reactive as staff members and we are reactive as delivery agents to react, to please or react to make the problem go away. And I'm encouraging you to turn around and go, no, hold up, you have to ask the question, is this urgent or is this important? Because importance tells me that this is gonna have an impact. It's gonna impact a customer, it's gonna impact a customer internally or externally. It's going to impact the quality and create abrasion via reviews, via callbacks, via, you know, uh, angry letters to the manager, call it what you want. Um, or is it urgent because someone got told that they need to do it or they're in trouble or someone got told third hand that this happened down the hall and Joe down the hall is upset. So we got to make Joe happy and get it done. Um, you will find pleasantly that when you have the conversation between urgency and importance, Urgency falls away for importance. And urgency is usually a false sense of urgency. Um, simply because we're asking authentically and we're asking 
from the team's perspective that, hey, what's really important here? And sometimes it's a, there, there's an overlap for urgency and importance and no brainer at that point in time, right? Something's on fire and it's important, get it done. Um, but you can't test that in. You have, to, you have to head that off to the past by going way, way upstream and trying to avoid those problems or going downstream and doing lessons learned and looping back and giving yourself a feedback loop. If you don't have a feedback loop, which is a true agile approach to testing, you'll never be successful. In today's day and age, um, this bullet gets me in trouble with my students and this bullet gets me in trouble with my peers. Let's see if we have a question come in here really quick. Let me just pause really quick. Um, how do you drive the conversation between urgent and important? Do you have a document or a guide? Um, so Darren, thanks for that question. So uh, no, I don't have a document for that. This is truly a conversation based uh, management situation. Uh, you can manage up, down, left, right with the conversation. Um, what I do with this is, let me going back to the urgency and importance is, uh, I ask for impact for the importance uh, for the conversation. So if you can remove the emotion from that request where your boss, my boss comes to me and says, hey, this is super urgent. The request in return should be, okay, show me why. Right? Um, and when we do that, we're able to ask the question again, is, is there a metric? Is there a, uh, a data point that I can talk to? Because if you just tell me it's urgent, now you're emotionally responding to me. And I don't know if your urgency is my urgency, right? We all see in the t-shirt that a lack of planning your part is not urgent on my part, right? And, and this is now conditioned behavior that we're trying to break. Um, what I've done in the past is for these kinds of conversations, I'll document them and I'll put them aside into a one note, I'll document them and put them into a project playbook. Um, shout out to Natalie Gilliam uh, on our team for teaching me how to do that. Um, when I was evolving from just a QA tester to being a consultant, um, we have these conversations and without naming names, we document the conversation said on this problem, this is how we fixed it. You can go back and give them a playbook. Um, do this long enough, you get a playbook that's about that thick. Um, and people get conditioned to not come at you with urgency or false urgency. Uh, I should have said false urgency here, but not come at you with false urgency, but come at you with important problems. And important problems create quality conversations. Um, again, please understand that I'm using big Q. I'm, I, I'm looking at this from a perspective of a mindset that says, no matter what we do on a daily basis, everything we're building is good. I shouldn't have doubt. I shouldn't have a doubt as to what the heck am I building? Why are we doing this? How are we going to get there? No, we're going to get it done. With the true agile approach to testing, thank you for asking the question, Darren, by the way. Uh, with the true agile approach to testing, um, we now find ourselves in these conversations for MVPs and we find ourselves in these conversations for um, uh, doing incremental delivery. And I think what's important for that is, again, it doesn't matter whether the problem, whether you're building a, a, a Porsche or you're building a building. Um, the, uh, the ask is still important is why am I building this? How are we gonna build it? Is it gonna fit? And it forces folks who are not used to the agile mindset, whether it's agile for business or agile for testing or agile for technology, who are not used to this mindset to ask that qualitative question, um, which is why you communicate with purpose and outcomes. Um, I have now come to a point with my career and my approach to, to differentiating testing and quality by saying that I will test X, it will cost you Y. And that cost is usually time or that cost is usually um, a thousand test cases, you get five. I'm sorry, each of these test cases takes eight hours to run. I don't have the automation framework. I don't have the human beings. Now tell me what's important. Now let's talk about risk. Let's talk about our purpose of doing this test. Let's talk about the outcomes of doing this work. Um, and you'll find that the conversation distills down. Um, everybody's had this conversation, and I know I have had conversations about this as well with folks on this call, is that as you start peeling the layers out, the question becomes of, okay, that's good enough. Yeah, you know, that'll be good. Yeah, that, yeah that'll meet the requirement. Yeah, that, and, and those are the conversations we want to drive to without the noise. Um, 
uh, I know I see I have Gina here on the phone as well. And, and Gina is one of our associates I did here as well. She's in a different part of, of our client. Um, I know that Gina's had this conversation with our, with our clients and has helped coach that in with a qualitative mindset. It's like, I'm not going to do this work because you asked me to do the work. I'm asking you why you want me to do this work and what is the outcome of this work. And now we're starting to see this feedback loop come out from our buyers and our partners in development, in testing, in design, in UX going, hey, we're doing this for X, Y, and Z. We're hoping to achieve X, Y, and Z. And we will lean on you as the quality advocates and as the test team to deliver this result. And now the conversation's easy. A year ago, this conversation was, well, we don't know what we're really building it for. We, we were just given a spec and we're just gonna drop it hot on you guys and figure this out. And that's not going to work. So I hope that answers the question uh, around urgency and importance before I move on. Uh, Jack, I think we have two polls coming up here for the next slide, don't we? Yes, we do. I will launch that right now. Um, two questions about quality. Thank you. Give people a few seconds here to oh, read. God, this is the, oh, I forgot about these these uh, polls, Jack. These are the dreaded all of the above. I'm pretty sure we're going to get a lot of the all of the above here. <coughs> Excuse me. I can give it a few more seconds. Sure. And Jack, keep me honest on time here as well, please. Okay, thank you for those that responded to the poll. I will share the results. All of the above, yep. Okay, so thank you, Jack, for doing that. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about the first one. Uh, why do you think quality falters in the project? And I think not enough time to test and requirements not being clear enough. Um, yeah, and I see that we got 27% on the requirements not clear enough and 7%, seven people said that all of the above. Okay. And then creating a culture of quality. So I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Um, requirements not being clear enough is something that is an everyday battle. Uh, honestly, it's an everyday battle. So let's talk about the culture of quality. And I want to show you how in the last two years, I was able to change a few things around at the current client that I'm at using a very blended art versus science kind of approach. So uh, perceived quality, and I have to give a hats off to Dave Faulkner and our team for this because he said this is the best way to visually represent this is sometimes the perceived quality at a leadership level or even a contributor level is that the product slash service that you're building is a Maserati. And what the actual quality is, is a Ford Pinto. And it made me laugh when he said this out loud. And, and it's true because you look at the two cars, Sure, they're cars, but which one would you rather drive? And if you're the exception to the case where you want to drive the Ford Pinto on the bottom right, let's have this conversation after the fact, because I'd like to understand how you appreciate wood paneling versus a sleek green machine. Um, when I put this in front of another person two days ago uh, at the client, it clicked in the head going, oh crap, you're right. I think of our product as a well-functioning oil machine when it really isn't. And, and that's where the incidents are coming from. That's where the escalations are coming from. And I said, yeah, there's a Delta there. Your perception of the quality you have for the product and service you support as a leader is completely different from the contributor level for what your teams, their scrum masters and their delivery agents perceive the actual quality. So taking the Digineer capability and maturity model that we use for our uh, PMO assessment, I modified it for quality and I ran a single blind assessment. So a single blind assessment is showing the scrum teams on one side, the same questions and having them answer the questionnaire. And then a couple of days later, letting it sit and simmer and then going to the leadership and running the same questions by them. Um, and then what I did was I, without getting into the details, it's a weighted spreadsheet. So it's got 40 questions in five major categories that have weights on them from zero through four. Um, and then I created a visual representation and threw it up against them. The outcome was that we were immediately able to identify gaps in the overall approach to the delivery. 
it immediately created an organic conversation of why is this happening and how do we fix it quickly? And something that I was pleasantly surprised by it instilled a accountability culture that was missing in the organization due to the non-familiarity of overall agile practices. So let me show you the visual here really quick. Um, on the left is the leader's approach based on 40 questions condensed down to five major categories, team dynamics, team environment, the product, management of the product, and the vision for the product, agile process mechanics, and agile engineering practices, zero being the poorest, four being the best. Um, this is the leader's perspective of what they thought. In this situation, they thought that their overall product and services rendered through this product were not doing as well as they thought. They thought the team environment was great, but everything else needed improvement. On the right, you see what their five scrum teams under them uh, came up with. The scrum masters took this questionnaire to their teams, helped me condense them out and brought it out. And as you can tell, the team is doing great in their opinion. The team environment is fantastic. Four out of the five teams came and said, nah, oh, three, excuse me. Yeah, four out of the five teams came and said, nah, our, our product management, our product vision is not good enough. Our agile process mechanics are great, but our engineering practices don't match up to what we think is good. Again, what we think is good. So currently at the, at the client that I'm at, um, we have an independent third-party team tell us what our agile culture should be. Based on that agile culture, these teams self-evaluated and self-reflected in a breakout session and said, here is where we lack. Overall, from a quality perspective, here is where we lack as a quality team. And I really appreciate that they looked at it that way. Um, but it immediately opened up the conversation. And I'd like to bring attention to your bottom right. As you can see, leadership and the teams both thought that product management and vision needed to improve. So immediately we brought in the product team to the conversation and said, hey, here is how we self-evaluated. We are not getting quality requirements in our opinion. We are not getting testable requirements backed up by fact and data. Here are the incidents and the escalations caused by poor requirements because we, we pulled that data out. And then we had the Delta conversation of what do we do to close that gap? How do we give or get better quality requirements? And to the product owner's credit, they decided that they would go back to the drawing board and figure out how to use better tools, how to train themselves better in agile requirement writing, and also, truth be told, figure out where they messed up. Some of these things that they did were um, you know, just not up to what we would call good agile practices. The culture of quality quotient that I'm putting here in place allows you to see the delta right away. This is just factual data. This is just a subjective conversation that is weighted that allows you to have this conversation. So last but not least on the slide, what I did was I asked for the next time we do this in January or February, I've asked for a score of 3.5 or higher per category. We'd like to close that gap. The difference in the score drives process change. From a Digineer perspective for process change and feel free to talk to me about it. Feel free to talk to anybody on the Digineer team about this. Um, we lean into our frameworks for organizational change management, which is a communication framework for how to improve your processes. Uh, we use commitment-based management, which is something that we all get trained in. Um, it's uh, essentially agile for business by holding our teams and holding ourselves accountable. And we have what's called an active response framework. This is our ability to be on the ground with the teams that are delivering during the project. If something goes wrong, we have a communication framework and a response framework with the team built in to start communicating out to business going, hey, you have a problem on uh, platform X. Uh, patients are not getting their bills or patients are getting double billed, blah, blah, blah. And we have a team that runs through here and builds these conversations ultimately creating a quality assessment on the back end of the solution and ultimately then creating a playbook so that the issue never happens again. We've had this successfully implemented at various clients. So I'm not gonna bore you with the details here. If you wanna have conversations during Q and A, we can do that. Um, more importantly is remeasuring at intervals. The only way you can build quality into your product and build quality into your life cycle and build quality into your organization is to keep remeasuring. 
and to keep having those deeply reflective conversations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, scrum teams call them, you know, uh, post, post delivery walkthroughs, you can call them whatever you want them. For me, I just lock leaders into a room and say, what sucked? And, and that's just my style of working with these people going, what sucked for the last three months? What really hurt us? Let's just do a whiteboard session and put it up there. And then let's talk about under those major categories, what really annoyed you? Incidents, escalations, bad requirements, bad testing, bad timelines, bad constraints. Um, what, what do you want to fix? And then we take the next 90 days, make a plan, come back and fix it. Um, I want to say that we are still actively working the constraint problem. The constraint problem is truly, truly, in my opinion, the inability of our peers to uh, be trained correctly. We have not afforded them the ability to succeed as agilists. Um, that's hard. If, if, an, if an organization's evolving, it's hard to train a thousand people to get better at agile. It's, it's hard to train upsets of those people to hone in those skills, which is why the conversation is at the ground level with transparency, with purpose, with outcome. So for me, quality isn't about, can I test it? Quality is about how, why, and when, and more importantly, what am I going to test? And should I even test it if I answered the first three questions? Because we actually built a good product. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'm going to open up to the Q&A here. Um, just being some last points here. Uh, quality is not a hard conversation. Uh, please, please maintain transparency in your risk. Uh, you're not calling out. I'm going to use Jack as an example. Jack and I have worked at, exam, uh, at, at clients together. Uh, when Jack and I work together, I don't call out Jack's work. I'm calling out the, uh, the, the actual process that we put in place. Like, hey, Jack, did we do this well enough? You know? and, and Jack is polite enough and Jack is self-aware enough to go, well, it's not questioning me. It's questioning the output of work I put out. Is that good enough to snuff? I, we've had that conversation. I know we've had that conversation. Uh, we've communicated risks all the time. Uh, understand the difference between urgency and importance. And then uh, foster a better culture for quality from day one. Um, and I say that, and it's easier said than done. And I know that a lot of people will scoff at that statement, but honestly, ask yourself the question of when you walk into a conversation and say, I just want to be better. I want us to succeed. Who's going to fault you for that? If they get mad at you for wanting to succeed, we have a bigger problem at hand for culture, not quality. So at that point, uh, I know we have 15 minutes left or 20 minutes left. I will open it up to conversation and questions. Got a couple questions, Paresh. Sure. Uh, the first one, how do you handle leadership with competing priorities or combative approaches to delivery? Um, so that's an interesting conversation. So uh, one thing that we've had success with um, at another client that we were dealing with, um, leadership has been tasked by the C-suite to deliver on certain parameters, right? Um, and more often than not, sometimes our leaders uh, whether they're buyers, peers, even inside our organization, get myopia on delivering what's been told. Um, and it takes a delicate but honest approach to back them out of the tunnel and have them look at the, the rest of the picture. It's like, I don't want you to deliver a, a database migration. I want you to deliver a database migration that also helps this part of the team and that part of the team. Um, I'm not saying that leaders come at any conversation with malice because that's not who we are. Um, I don't think anybody has malice intended when they come to work. I think um, decisions are made based in vacuums and a quality conversation is going to be, hey, you know, Joe, if you do this, Jack's going to have this problem. I will have this problem. You know, Gina's going to have that problem. So let's think about your competing priority. And let's not be combative. I'm not trying to make you fail. I'm allowing you to succeed, but also bring the team with. And that's a huge conversation to have. It's hard. Got a, another question here. It looks like there's some background here. So um, um, overall, your approach uh, to this person, they're saying it makes a lot of sense. Um, but most accounts they've been at still look at their dev team as being a separate group, the testing team as a separate group. Mm -hmm. uh, Etc. If if this person wanted to raise your approach, where and with whom should they start the conversation? That's wonderful. So um, 
the the silo teams is a problem um and silo teams that are not co-located even worse um bring up the conversation with your leader of qa lock them in the room with the leader of development that's like putting two ex spouses in a room and sometimes things won't get done but putting them in the room and and understanding and translating for them that as people who are if you can in your head drop the pie chart they're about 66% of the delivery cycle um and their hands on keyboard and they need to start working together they can start influencing change because i can tell you that we've had this happen at the current client that i'm at development now says i am not moving forward without qa approval i am not going to do this without qa support and vice versa qa comes and says no no the devs are done yet we're not touching this code right i'm not saying you create an us versus them mentality you're trying to create an us versus us mentality like if we don't do this together we don't get to the finish line so start with the dev and qa folks bring in your support organizations operations logistics um and then present the united front to your business um unfortunately there's there are organizations that thrive on divide and conquer and you just got to beat that and it, it is work it's not pleasant it certainly isn't um easy but that's what you got to do that's the job <coughs> excuse me another question uh mm -hmm. can, can you speak a little bit about the relationship between requirements reporting and qa because most of the time this person has seen that requirements in QA come first from start to finish, but the reporting is usually more of an afterthought. Oh my gosh, yeah, isn't that isn't that just a pain? Um, so this is again that myopia, right? Um, the myopic approach to requirements writing. Again, if there's any product owners on the on the on the webinar, I'm not pointing fingers at you. I am looking at the unit of work. Um, what we did back in the day and i say back in the day but again the 2000s when we were still doing things along the lines of um you know <clears throat> waterfall methodology before agile became a thing was let's just build it and we'll deal with the next phase of the project and and that mentality is carried forward to now let's just build it and we'll deal with requirements for reporting when it happens um in today's world in today's new internet of things approach um in today's data science world uh data and reporting analytics is something that shouldn't be left behind um we it behooves the qa teams situation it behooves the development teams situation and i use those two as, as an example because they're creating the actual artifact that becomes the product to start talking about downstream impact um that that and again if you're a project manager or a scrum master or a product owner um i would again ask the question of why am i building this what's the ultimate goal and i get and i bet you the answer is going to be well so we can have the customers in the back end make money well how are you going to make money well with the data great where is the data coming from and you'll be surprised to see how many people go oh we didn't think about the data you didn't think about the reporting either and again are you calling them out no you're using the universal you by saying not nah, nobody did um and and so to that question i think that the requirements in qa come first from start to finish if i if i can paraphrase that correctly if i heard it right um reporting is the afterthought because a lot of people look at reports as hand wavy data slicing that needs to happen on an urgent requirement right hey 15 minutes ago somebody called me and said i need i need a data dump of this shouldn't be the case that should be readily available we should be building a quality product again this comes to the same question right if the idea on the back of the bar napkin did not translate to a fully functioning product why did we build it <clears throat> couple more questions uh at what point do conversations about quality become conversations around logistics like who's got hours capacity etc oh that's a constant conversation jack i think that um if you're not talking about well let me let, let me rephrase how i was about to say that because i think that i need to articulate that better the conversation about logistics and hours is human capital. Now if I asked you Jack or anyone else on this webinar to work an 80 hour work week, what is the quality of work I'm going to get from hour 1 versus hour 80? Right? So 
the conversation then becomes, am I asking Jack to work 80 hours a week? And if I'm asking him to do that, what is the outcome and the purpose? Can I, and, and again, if, as you peel those layers apart, which again, people will compete and say, no, this is going to take too much time. Yeah, that's the point. It, 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 it truly is that age old measure twice, cut once, right? And so um, if you start asking about logistics and who's, on, who's got time to test and who's got the hours to do the development, you're already behind the eight ball, so to speak. You should be asking the questions of why am I asking them to work that kind of hours? Why am I asking for 85 people to test something on a Saturday afternoon when I could have gotten away with five people in May? But now it's September and I have 85 people logging onto a conference bridge, which is about as efficient as it sounds. It's all about timing. Everything is about timing and that, that whole shift left thing doesn't exist anymore, right? We're all in the same pool. We just got to make sure everybody's swimming in the same direction, to use the analogy. Uh, looks like one final question. Uh, when is the best time to communicate risk outside of the team? Um, always. I know that blows people's hair back. Always. Uh, people don't like bad news. Um, I found that specifically in the Midwest, uh, having worked with clients up and down the Midwest corridor, we tend to not like bad news. Uh, we tend to like not, not look at it. Uh, but it, the news is bad only if it's too late. But if we start a project today and we go through a requirements process, a requirements uh, decomp process, and we walk out of it, and we walk out with 15 things in the parking lot, guess what those parking lot items are? Things I don't want to talk about. Are those things I don't want to talk about today because of resource constraints? Sounds like a risk. Are those things I don't want to talk about because of a timing situation? Sounds like a risk. So why not just communicate that out? Again, are you offending people's sensibilities or are you looking at the unit of work that we're asking of ourselves and saying that we're not doing a good enough job to cover those bases? Always communicate that risk. A quality conversation and a quality team with a quality deliverable will always communicate risk. What you do with that risk is the secondary part of that conversation. Great. Um, that's all the questions we have. So Perfect. on behalf of Paresh and Digineer, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. This concludes our webinar. Uh, please look for the recordings of our webinars on www.digineer.com and be sure to follow us on our social channels. Also, if you have any questions, send an email to info at Again, thank you everybody and have a great day. Thank you everyone.